Good morning, everybody. The Lord be with you. Clearly, the Lord is with the England Football Club. So, um, it's quite a good result, I'll give you that. So, I'm, is it 4 0? Not bad, not bad. So, rule on uh, Wednesday? Wednesday. Yes, luckily, the um, visitation service for uh, the church wardens is on Tuesday. Because otherwise I fear that, you know, at least one of our church wardens might not have pitched up for it. But uh, we're all right. Possibly the archdeacon might not have pitched up for it either. So anyway, I hope that you've had a good week. And it's great to welcome you either in this place or indeed um, over the internet to worship with us today. So in the knowledge that wherever we are, we are in unity with Christ. Let us say together the words of the prayer of unity. Almighty and everlasting God, as we come together as your church, the body of Christ, we thank you that we can worship you together. Even if we are not in the same place, we thank you for this opportunity to pray together and remember each other at this time. Thank you that you have brought us safely to this day, and we ask that you keep us from danger. Guide us in all that we do, and may what we do be righteous in your sight. Bless us now, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the words of the prayer of preparation. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And at the start of a new week, we might spend some time reflecting on the week that has gone by and bring to our ever-merciful Lord those things that are lying heavy on our heart. We say together the words of the prayer of confession. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of that we fail to do for the sake of Jesus who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for today, the fifth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have our first reading. The first reading today is taken from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows. 
was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of this, these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for our gospel reading. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people who were ill and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but are not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take a seat. I met a lovely lady and a dear friend in the supermarket this week and told her I was preaching this Sunday. I didn't have a clue at that point what I was going to preach on, but it was her words that actually brought me the material for this sermon. And her advice to me was, well, don't forget to smile. My mum used to say to me, the gospel is good news and should be preached joyfully. There are so many preachers who don't smile and make it seem like a message of gloom and doom. So, my friend, this one's for you. I will stay, uh, try to stay cheerful throughout. Yes, 
The gospel is good news. Jesus is good news. Salvation and life eternal are good news. If only people would accept that, that today and reach out to Jesus, they'd find the gospel news in a world the good news of the gospel in a world full of bad news and gloom and doom right there in front of them. Yet, in our reading from Mark today, it's evident people don't want to see or hear this good news, even when it is staring them in the face. We see Jesus is rejected. He has done all of these marvelous things. They've heard about them. They've witnessed some of the healings themselves, but they still don't believe who he is. And we're told Jesus is amazed. What does he have to, put, to do to prove who he is? Well, we know the price that he had to pay to show us who he really is. What is even more surprising to Jesus in this passage is the people who reject him are those who he's grown up with, people in his hometown. He grew up there as a normal boy with his brothers and sisters and mother, we're not quite sure what happened to Joseph. He has been away and he's done some marvelous things. And he returns to his own town to come and save and bring good news to his own people. Jesus is amazed at their unbelief. We are amazed. But should we be? Because isn't this modeling exactly what happens in our society today. We love to bring people down, put them in their place. It doesn't matter what great things they do or say, they get it above their station and they need pulling down a peg or two. I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of that. How sad is that? Why can't we just marvel at the great job people do, give them a boost, without finding the negatives. Those who've been in the teaching profession will be familiar with all this. You're constantly open to criticism. At a parent's evening, you can get 29 out of 30 comments from parents who are pleased with you and what you've done, but it's always the one negative comment you remember. When I was head of English at primary school, I had to observe and give feedback on lessons. But I was always told to find positive and negative things to feed back on, so people had something to work on. Never was it even considered there was a remote possibility a lesson could be perfect. Because there's always something to learn. But wouldn't it be great for once if we spent a whole day telling people the great things that they're doing, and forget the negatives. But we don't, because we're human. We think we're not made like that, and we don't learn like that. But here is Jesus, human, yet divine. He is perfect. He teaches perfect lessons and brings great news. Why wouldn't people want to hear that? Why would they criticize that? He comes, in the words of Luke 4, 18, to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim deliverance to the captives, recover sight to the blind, and to set people free, to offer truth, hope, peace, promise, salvation, to give meaning to life. Why do they reject him? The answer to this lies in his preaching. He stands in the synagogue doing this, a task which was always undertaken by a rabbi or a trainee rabbi. Not anyone could preach. Just as today, it's not permitted for just anyone to preach in the church. And here comes Jesus, a normal bloke to them, preaching. You can imagine their comments. Who on earth does he think he is? 
What makes him think he's good enough to preach the Holy Scriptures in our synagogue? Isn't he just a carpenter, the repairman? As a carpenter, Jesus would have spent most of his time when he was among them repairing furniture and buildings. There would have been new work too, but most of the work would have been spent wandering around town looking for things to repair or buildings to help with. Carpentry also included general building work. So this man to them was just the repairman. What right did he have to tell them how to live their lives? And isn't there an irony here? Jesus is the repairman, physically with wood, but also spiritually with the wisdom of God. In miracles, there is evidence he can and does repair people physically. He is the ultimate repairman, putting the universe back together after it is broken by sin. Then in his hometown, Jesus tries to perform miracles and lay his hands on people, but they don't want to know. It's not that he can't, or that they have to have absolute faith in him, or that he lacks compassion, but most likely, many of them didn't ask. If you don't believe someone can heal you, why would you ask them to? Jesus is completely taken aback by their lack of faith. But this was a sign to him. He saw just how much work there was to, to do and how little time there was to do it. This is a very intriguing story. And many of us are comfortable in judging the silly Nazarenes who did not honor Jesus and were not open to his teaching. But aren't we, in fact, like those people in Nazareth? We have known Jesus all our life. We celebrate his birthday every year. We've watched him grow through the scriptures. We know his mother and father. He's extremely familiar to us. Yet how hard is it to witness for Christ within our own families? The wonderful Christian leader, Henri Nguyen, said this about ministering to his own family. I had a dream that I would be the priest of my family. Everybody would love me. I would baptize the children and bury my uncles and aunts, and I would be connected to everyone else. Now, my mother has died. My father is 90 and becoming blind. My sister got separated from her husband, and neither wants that much to do with me. One brother has a very shaky marriage. Another brother's wife has cancer, and they all left the church. Nobody had their children baptized. They don't even go to church. They think I'm an interesting medieval figure, but they don't know what I'm all about. When I come home, they say, just be our brother, don't talk about religion. That is a loss. I cannot be a minister, a priest for my own family. The little children don't, anything, don't know anything of what their uncle Henri is about. They know he's doing strange things. He goes to this church. He has this white thing on him. My own family, my own flesh. Wonderful people who have suffered a lot but part of a culture that has moved away from the church. It took me a long time to not feel guilty about that, to not feel that it was my fault. How many of us feel guilt about not being able to share Christ with our families because we might be ridiculed or rejected? Our gospel reading reminds us that the community of faith is sometimes the hardest place for the good news of Jesus to be heard. The disciples had great success in the villages where they were not known. They received the message, 
it was different. Today, perhaps that's the case too. Many people believe they've heard it all before. They've heard all this Jesus stuff. And so they crave something new. And maybe that's why many people move towards the newest spiritual craze. But we are the people of God. We hear the message of Jesus. And so we must believe it, live it, and witness to Christ, proclaiming the good news just as the disciples did. In this way, we draw closer to him, finding unconditional love and peace. We don't need to earn it to prove we are of worth in her, in, to prove we are of worth. In her book, Leaving Church, Barbara, Town, uh, Bra Barbara Brown Taylor speaks of her longing for the nearness of God. She thought that the way to achieve this was through working harder, knowing more, never saying no to anyone, and ignoring her own needs. And this was the pattern of her ministry until she discovered that it wasn't working for her. Only when she was able to accept God's unconditional love did she achieve a sense of personal wholeness. When that finally happened, she discovered that reality of being at peace with God made her more useful to the kingdom than all of her efforts to be a superstar priest. And that's the good news. God's love is unconditional and is for all of us. We don't need to continue to strive to earn it, and that's something to smile and be joyful about. And today, I give thanks for my conversation with Brenda for providing me with the material for today's sermon. I could have preached rejection condemnation, judgment, shame, blame, so many of the negative aspects of the passage today. But the fact is, the true message of Christ, the true message that he wants us all to hear, is that of love, forgiveness, and hope. You see, the good news is, we don't have to prove who we are. We don't need to try to put ourselves above others. We don't need to gain status or be noticed by anyone other than Christ. Christ is our good news, and we should be daily celebrating that he chose us to follow him, that he loves us no matter who we are. He knows us, and he loves us. So let's smile and celebrate the good news today and pass it on to all who we meet. Jesus has saved all of us and loves us all. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. When Karen and I were in the vestry getting ready, I said, oh, I said, I really need a nice uplifting sermon. Spot on. Thank you. That was, that was certainly for me, that uh, has, has raised my spirits. I'm smiling, so there you go. <laughs> okay. So, in the hope that all of us are feeling uplifted, let's stand and declare our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for our time of prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O Lord, for all people everywhere, those close to us and those far away. We pray for those who minister and preach, that they may never find themselves rejected out of hand as our Saviour Jesus Christ was in his hometown synagogue. We pray for the worldwide church and for the churches here in Basildon, asking for your help to grow in faith. Help us also to respect the beliefs of others, even if we do not share them, to celebrate what we have in common and accept our differences. Guide us in our ministries as we live each day determined to spread the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away arrogance and hatred that infects the hearts of those who pursue violence and terrorism. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and peace. We pray today for peacemakers throughout the world. May they bring hope out of despair, peace out of conflict, and prosperity out of poverty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our families and friends, and especially for young people, that they may grow up knowing love and hope, valuing life and respecting others. We pray for those who are about to leave school and move on to the next stage in their lives. We pray for Messy Church and Make Lunch as preparations are made to meet face to face once more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for your wonderful world and are sorry for how we have treated it. Please be with those suffering at present from the effects of climate change and show us how we can halt this. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all who suffer in body, mind or spirit and for those who take care of them. We pray for the sick, especially for those like St Paul who have been given a thorn in the flesh. We pray for any who are in special need of our prayers at this time, especially those known personally to us, and we raise them now before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them for members of our families who have died and whose anniversaries we recall. Help us to experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit within us and the fellowship of the church family around us until we are reunited once more in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we pray for ourselves as we go from our worship today to start the week ahead, we ask that in all we do, we may walk more closely with you at our side, safe in the knowledge that your fatherly love and care knows no bounds. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Please stand for the peace. 
God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of socially distanced peace. Peace be with you. Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again, you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy, and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna 
in the highest. Lord God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendor and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love, made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation, loving us to the end. He gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. Amen, Lord, we believe. On the night he gave up himself for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Lord, we believe. Therefore, we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high, and we long for his coming in glory. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption, Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Look with favor on your people, and in your mercy hear the cry of our heart. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free, and fill your church with power from on high. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with St. Andrew and all your saints, at the table in your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. body of Christ broken for us all. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for us all. Amen.
pray together. Lord, we have broken your bread and received your life. By the power of your Spirit, keep us always in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I must admit, when we started, I thought, oh, we're not going to be able to sing this, uh, this morning. But it looks as though we are, because the sun is shining, which is good news. Um, I haven't got any particular notices other than to say, um, if you look at your notice sheet, whether or not online or in, in hard copy, um, you will see that within the deanery we are going to be having a confirmation service in October, so quite a while away, at the other St Andrews, St Andrews in Wickford. Um, if anybody, having especially having listened to um, Karen's service, if anyone who has been sort of wondering about making the next step in their faith journey, um, those of you who aren't already confirmed or you're wondering what confirmation actually means, um, please get in touch because um, I'm hoping that over the course of the next few weeks and months um, a group of us will be able to get together just to explore what being confirmed in the Church of England means and then, God willing, um, in October Bishop John will be confirming and baptising if people aren't baptised at St Andrews. So just something to think about anyway. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and those you love and pray for, and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.